This afternoon, the affairs Coco production could suffer due to Coco Ball's decision to self-finance for the 2024-2025 crop season. Also this hour, 19 independent presidential aspirants have so far picked nomination forms to contest the December 7th polls. A lot later on Ghana Remembers today, we look at some promises previously made by the governing New Patriotic Party repeated in the 2024 manifesto. Hello there, welcome to another afternoon. This is News Central, I am Maui Naibeta. And I am Kemeni Amana, News Central starts now. Now, this afternoon, data from the National Road Safety Authority shows that election periods record high cases of deaths from road crashes. This is attributed to the blatant disregard for road traffic regulations at an ongoing event to launch the Road Traffic Code of Practice for Political Activities in Accra. A strong call is being made for the political parties to mainstream code of practice in the election campaign strategies to help reduce deaths during this year's election season. We'll cross over to Christian Yali for more on this, but first let's run you through some of the statistics that have come up as far as road crashes are concerned in election years. Excuse me. In 2004, Deaths increased by 27.4% as, as compared to the previous year, 2003. Four years later, in election year 2008, it decreased by 5.1% compared to the year before. Uh, in election year of 2012, deaths went up again by 1.9%. Let's fast forward to 2016. We know that 44 people died in 100 crashes during that election year. 157 vehicles were involved in those crashes and 15.6% increase if we compare that to the same period in 2015. Uh, let's head over to Christian Yale now. He's bringing us more from that event that is looking to uh, galvanize political parties to work towards, towards fewer uh, election year accidents and deaths through road crashes. Uh, uh, Chris, good afternoon to you. Talk to us about this event and uh, what they have been saying so far about election year and road crashes. All right, Kamini. And so it is a worrying trend. Uh, a very ugly picture that is being painted today by the National Road Safety Authority about how road carnages, deaths especially, continue to increase each year during election campaigns. And when you look at the statistics, it just means that right all the way from 2000 to date, or to the last election year, which was 2020, each of the election years is seeing a higher number of cases compared to the previous years, which is a major issue of disturbing, uh, uh, worrying development that the National Road Safety is talking about. And what makes it very worrying in case, indeed, is that when you look at the number of road crashes, according to the WHO 2023 uh, status report on road crashes per country, the road crashes that we, re we record in Ghana account for nearly 3 to 5% of Ghana's GDP. And so it is not even a mere conversation about political parties. It indeed extends and goes beyond political parties. What is the issue here is that it has been noticed and noted that over the years, political parties during their campaigns tend to flout road traffic regulations. They do not adhere to them because, of course, they are touring across the nation. They are going all across the mm. nation. And so indeed, they need to speed up. 
And when they do I this, see. the other factor is that they are, you know, members or supporters follow them in drafts. They pass, they don't obey seating arrangements and what have you. And so, mm. you know, it is leading to more deaths. And so the road safety is saying that political parties must note that the more they lose individuals, the more they lose votes. What it means is that if you're going by the 50 plus one narrative of winning an election, then it means that if you get a 50% and you lose one so that one so cannot give you that vote for you to win the election. Mm -hmm. and so, well, so, a, so let's talk about this code. Call. Let's talk about this code, Christian. How do they plan to implement it? All right, and so um, the code of practice for the political parties has been launched. What is the target is that political parties would mainstream these codes and the guidelines therein in their manifesto. And so we have been speaking to the political party representatives here who mentioned, for instance, that they are going to adopt the best practices that have been outlined in this code of practice into their manifestos and into their policies going forward. What is the case in the case of the NDC, for instance, is that they believe one of the measures is by uh, regulating or legalizing the business of Okada, for instance. And so when you speak to the deputy communications officer for the NDC, Malik Basintali, he makes the point that the promise by John Mahama, for instance, to legalize and regulate mm. the operations of Okada is one of the ways to deal with road carnages on the road. And so the road safety is going to keep tabs with all the political parties to ensure that mm. they mainstream all of this. And then we have the uh, police MTTD who are also represented here as well as the Peace Council. We have the Electoral Commission officers as well who are I see. So, going so to Christian, and do this together. Uh, Christian, quickly, are the political parties happy to be part of this? What are they saying? Indeed, they are, they are very happy. And when you talk to them, they believe that any measure that is going to help to sanitize uh, our road network or our road system is one that they wholeheartedly endorse and accept. And so you have the NPP here, the NDC here, the New Force, the Movement for Change, uh, Equiadon uh, Force Party, and all of them are uh, heavily represented here. You have a representation of all the political parties here to ensure that this is implemented to the latter, to Very ensure well. that we don't record more cases of death in this year's electioneering campaign. Feminine. Indeed, Christian, thank you so much for the reporting. Would even hear Christian Yali uh, joined us from the National Road Safety Authority's event to include uh, political parties and other electoral stakeholders uh, in cabin road crashes uh, during election years. Speaking of elections, at least 19 independent presidential aspirants have so far picked nomination forms from the Electoral Commission to contest in the December 7th elections. The EC says this high number shows the need for some form of restriction to be imposed to avoid a situation where too many candidates will be on the ballot paper. Uh, Director of Training, Dr. Sheribo Kweku, has been speaking on this matter and the issue of a peace pact to my colleague, Noble Crosbyana. Most of the people think that, for example, we are exhibiting the 2020 race. So they'll tell you that uh, 2020 I voted. So why, will, why should my name get, get out of it? Or uh, 2023, I voted. So they don't believe that after voting, something can happen to your name. Then there have been instances where, you see, first of voting, once you get your ID number and your biometrics, you vote. We don't care whether you are a male, whether you are a female, your age and the span of your name. But there, are, there have been instances where some people want to use their card for some international transaction. And even though you need a passport, but they will ask you that we want you to add there. Because they know that there have been instant people where there are inconsistencies. The age on the uh, 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 passport is different from the age on Ghana card, different from the age on the uh, voter ID card. So some of the times, and that's why you see people coming to plead that, do this for me, do that for me. And it is only during the exhibition that all errors could be corrected and effective. There were concerns from particularly the NDC over the timing, the timelines given to the party to go through the provisional uh, register. But since you made it available for them, what has been the feedback from the parties to you? Um, I've not heard of any complaints, so I'm tempted to believe that they are okay with, okay with that. There's also uh, the worry over the coalition challenges of uh, the commission, case in point, uh, uh, recent statistics from uh, the limited registration exercise 
even from uh, the numbers put out by the chairperson of the commission in parliament. The commission has assured that it is working on it or it has worked on it. Uh, practically, what has the commission done to ensure that these things do not happen? With respect to figures in and the rest, if you follow the process, the data itself were not changed, but it's the infographs that we put on our website that they copy and paste where they made a mistake by in one region they repeated the same figure 25 2500 to 2500 was it not was it yes, 2000, 2000, 2000. then the other one too was uh, the number of challenges they, they, they did the histogram instead of uh, when they were putting the figures uh, I, uh, for the histogram they repeated the guitar challenges for apply is so it's not that the issue that it's frequent in it. Actually, they, they actually tell there were no problems. So we have all learned from all these things. Now, if you talk of the figure that is uh, a chairperson, you see, if you talk of provisional register, they will continue to change. We can't move away from elections this afternoon because the chief executive officer of the Kolobu Teaching Hospital, Dr. Opoku Wariam Puma, says the hospital's renal unit will remain open as adequate measures have been put in place to ensure availability of consumables. The facility reopened on Wednesday after more than three weeks of closure. My colleague Godwin Asidiba has been speaking to the CEO on plans to keep the facility open. A very difficult uh, relationship with you know this is a contract I inherited, mm -hmm. and so we're trying to see how best to get, I mean make the most out of this contract. And right. so, um, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, I think there was a problem with the, the vendor as well because okay. of the post train and the mm -hmm. kind of uh, people that we engage with. But there have been some changes in the Fresenius uh, uh, company, you know, recently, and so we have a new uh, rep who dealing with us who is very proactive and so we just just, just came in from south africa for a meeting so that was the meeting that uh, you know uh, i was in just before coming to speak to you and um, we've been assured that the they are also going to bring on board uh, 30 additional uh, dialysis machines which were owed to us from 2017 mm -hmm. you know and we've been trying to get these machines unsuccessfully so these ones are also coming on board the other uh, kit equipment that's also uh, going to uh, be brought in uh, rest osmosis machines and uh, the dialysis uh, you know tables and so on uh, so all those are uh, be going to be brought in uh, soon we hope that th this will uh, hit uh, i mean the institution before the end of the year so with the uh, once that the Honorable Minister is getting us, it means that now we have more degrees of freedom in terms of options so that we won't have a situation where because of restrictions or challenges with one particular source, mm -hmm. you know, we, we are not able to provide service. And so that is how, that is how, uh, so I'm very confident going forward that this would not be uh, a challenge anymore. Right. Uh, how about most of the patients who have lost confidence in the renal unit because interacting with some of them they mentioned that it's been happening over years and because the facility had a hint that they would be picketing at the premises today that was the reason why they had to open the renal unit so um okay so 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 i think uh, mm -hmm. i think i think that is uh, I'll, I'll be surprised I'll, I'll find that uh, I'll be unfortunate but i can understand why somebody would say that maybe they're feeling some frustration but i don't think that it's uh, that they are not confident because uh, why is it that uh, there's always a queue in Kolebu? Right. If, if there was a loss of confidence mm -hmm. in Kolebu, then they, we shouldn't see anybody coming here. So what are the long-term strategies that are being considered to improve self-sufficiency of the renal dialysis unit? Well, in terms of self-sufficiency, I think that is a bigger question. All right. Because um, at the moment, if I, the, there's a certain cost of providing the service. Mm -hmm. Now, it costs us around about 760 um, you know, uh, cities to provide a service. Right. But then the amount that has been uh, approved by Parliament for us to charge is 491. So that should tell you that immediately that for every session of dialysis that we are offering, we are under recovering. Okay. And so we are d talking to a number of um, stakeholders to come on board and see how they can support us to make up that deficit. Because we know that for a lot of our patients, if the, 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 the price were to be increased further, they may not be able to afford. Of course, the health insurance uh, has also come in with a package to support uh, uh, you know, those under 18 and those uh, uh, above uh, 60 years 
and then uh, and then for those also in the middle they, they they're also trying to support for a few sessions uh, every month and so on and so all those would, would help but then uh, we still have a bit of a, a, a little further to go and i believe that as the common uh, as the economy improves and as uh, the health insurance uh, scheme becomes a bit more robust we may be able to absorb some of these things and so that is why we also have to talk about prevention okay. because it's important that uh, you know all of us uh, make sure we are educating everybody mm -hmm. about kidney diseases, the fact that they are common, more common than we think. People shouldn't just be taking any kind of herbal medications mm -hmm. that are uh, prescribed herbal medication. People should also make sure that uh, if you are, have diabetes and are going to diabetes, you are taking your medications and controlling your blood sugar because the commonest uh, cause of uh, renal failure in our environment is, is, is diabetes. Away from health, this afternoon, there are fears cocoa production and its sale could suffer as Cocoa Board has announced it will not be obtaining a syndicated loan. The minority in Parliament has blamed the situation on mismanagement, a claim Cocoa Board is strongly disagreeing with. We'll hear more from Cocoa Board shortly, but first, a bit of data on Cocoa Board's performance in the last few years and perhaps why the minority continues to make the argument and make it strongly that what we're seeing in the cocoa sector, particularly, is as a result of mismanagement. Now, what you see right here is cocoa production over the last six, seven years. And we narrowed it down from 2021-2022 crop season. If you are to take a step back as at the 2016-2017 crop season where the country saw over 969,000 tons of uh, cocoa production, there's been a steady decline up until the 2020-2021 crop season, which saw the, the country produce in excess of 1 million uh, metric tons of cocoa uh, product or cocoa beans. Now, since 2020-2021, we've seen a gradual and yet consistent decline. And it started in the 2021-2022 crop season, where we recorded 683,000 metric tons of beans, a 32% drop from that 2020-2021 uh, uh, crop season. The next year, it was a 4.2 decline. From the 683,000 metric tons, it dropped to 654,000 metric tons. And then 2023-2024 crop season, it dropped further by 11.3%. From this figure, in terms of tons produced, it dropped to 580,000 metric tons. And all of these inclusive is what gives the minority uh, the impetus that there's been some level of mismanagement. And they make that case also if you look at the losses that have been posted by Cocoa Board since this particular administration took over. 395 million in 2017. That figure went up to 78.2 million in 2018. Went up further uh, or went down in 2018, but went up further uh, in 2019. 320.6 million. It's gone up in 2020, 426 million. And since then, it's been in the billions. In 2021, 2.4 billion cities in losses. 2022, 3.2 billion cities in losses. And then in 2023, 4.2 billion uh, cities in terms of losses. And so the crux of the argument, for which reason the NDC minority says, look, all of these challenges are as a result of mismanagement. Let's bring in um, into the conversation Obed. Owusu Adai, he is the co-convener of the Ghana Civil Society Cocoa Platform for a quick conversation in relation to all of the things that we've been seeing. And most importantly, uh, the decision by Cocoa Board not to seek uh, a syndicated loan. I appreciate that you could join us uh, this afternoon. From where you sit, does this help the cocoa uh, industry, particularly for the upcoming crop season, now that the source of funds is not guaranteed. We were targeting 1.5 billion, but now Cocoa Board says they will look internal rather than go out of the country. Thank you very much for having me. Um, in the first place, the decision by Cocoa Board not to go for offshore syndication for us as civil society is laudable because the argument we have always made is that 
cocoa bulb should be sustainable. It should be self-sufficient. You cannot run an enterprise um, based on borrowing every year, going to, to borrow money uh, to, to finance purchasing. So in principle, the decision not to borrow from the syndication market, that is laudable. But I think the bigger question is, if they are not going to borrow from the international market or they are not going to syndicate, then where are they going to get the, the money to be able to uh, finance the purchasing of cocoa for the 2024-2025 season? That is the answers we have not received from Cocoa Board yet. Um, there are several scenarios they could mm. be looking at. Um, the first scenario could be that they intend to work with the international licensing buying companies and the chocolate companies to pre-finance the purchasing of beans, which uh, in, uh, in, uh, indirectly will still be sold to them. So that be uh, uh, one way of looking at it. The other way, which is more threatening and scary, will be for Cocoa Board to want to go to the local um, commercial bank market to borrow. Why, um, why, do, you, why, do, you think, society, why do you think that is scary because realistically, oh. listening to uh, Joseph Mwangi Edu, that appears to be the more favorable option of seeking the money directly going to, to these local banks. Well, well, so okay, so now then he's given clarity. So if they are going to the commercial banks, where it becomes scary for us as civil society and for us as farmers, mm. now we need to go to the same commercial banks to borrow. And we know that the interest rates that these banks are giving um, between 26 to about 32 percent uh, interest rate. And, and, and so how, how sustainable would that be? that you, you are going to borrow at this rate to finance or pre-finance um, and purchasing of, of cocoa beans. Again, we, we know what has happened within the, the banking sector mm. for the past few years, where the, the solvency of some of the banks were, 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 were in question. If Cocoa Bolt is going onto the market, onto the local market, to borrow as, as much as 500 million US dollars, it will be the, 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 the effect on the, the standing of these commercial banks to be able to uh, provide uh, funding for other, other, other businesses or the, the private sector. So right. these are but a few of the questions that we will need Cocoa Bolt to help us to address and um, in order for us to accept that they're, they're not going to the syndication market. Right. We know that at the heart of this conversation about the syndicated loan are two thorny subjects. The management of Cocoa Board and what appears to be a consistent uh, series of losses being recorded. And then dwindling uh, productions as well. We know that in what, if we can say the current crop season, we've had to roll over over 200 metric tons for the next crop season. These are matters that are of grave concern. Does it look like even if we're able to raise the revenue, we'll be able to meet the production uh, numbers to be able to meet uh, that of our buyers as well? Yes, my brother, that is one of the most important important and the most serious issues that we need to be discussing. Yes, financing is important, but production is more important because without the, the commodity, without the cocoa beans, all these talk of financing. For, for example, last year, even the or last cocoa season, the syndication that they went for, they, they couldn't utilize all the money because there were no beans to buy. Right. And so for us, yes, that is a good point to make that we, we think cocoa board should be focusing and the attention to supporting farmers to be able to produce the base. We know some of the factors that is not allowing the farmers to be able to produce. The issue of illegal mining that is taking over cocoa farms. The issue of um, the, the CS uh, Triple D, which is destroying the, 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 the farms in the Western North. The solution disease. The issue of black pot disease that is destroying our farms. All these are the problems that we, uh, we, we, we think Cocoa Boss should be focusing on to address the productivity challenges. Then we can begin to talk about how to get money to um, purchase these beans. But if we don't do that and we are focusing on getting money uh, and raising funds, and even the last year funds we raised, we couldn't utilize, then mm. what is the essence? What is the essence of doing all this conversation? So great, let's, let's take two steps back right. and look at production. How do we support farmers to produce the beans? Then we can look at um, raising funds to buy the beans. 
Mr. Uso Adai, I appreciate that you could speak to us. That's all better. Uso Adai speaks on the CSO's COCO platform this afternoon on what is a subject that will rage on for quite a while because Ghana's COCO sector has been one of the backbones of the economy and helping to shore up the city for quite a long time. We can now hear from the Chief Executive Officer of COCO Board, Joseph Boahid, who insists the company is not on the verge of a collapse. Cocoa Board's decision to self-finance after 32 years of seeking offshore syndicated loan facilities has been touted as a bold move by a chief executive officer, Joseph Wahin Edu. But the quick question is, is this even possible and why now? Since 1992, Cocoa Board has been going offshore to borrow from a syndication of banks, or a consortium of banks. And... Uh, 32 years, I think, is quite a good time for any human being to, to learn his or her lessons. 32 years, we've learned our lessons. And we think that uh, it's, it's high time, you know, we wean ourselves um, from the offshore international financial markets and then um, you know finance the crop ourselves here if you're able to do that because this year where we send rfps for 1.5 billion dollars uh, we're going to look for 1.5 billion dollars looking at um, interest rates last year which were over eight percent plus at that cost it means that we, we can save um, almost about $150 million by just not going. For a loan that periodically shows up central bank's forest reserves and always on the lookout, it might be a big blow to the BOG's financials. The money will come. The dollars will flow in. Because the point is that when we borrow from outside, hmm, when we borrow from outside, you know, we borrow at an interest. That's what an interest. Now, when you borrow the money, the money comes in. You change into what? CDs, isn't it? You buy cocoa. You send the cocoa to the, uh, the buyer. Eh? And then he pays in dollars to the, to the lender. What have you achieved? Is it good that... Always Cocoa Board should be heard going to borrow. Is that tag? Are we comfortable with that tag? Today you've heard that Cocoa Board is not going to borrow. And then... <laughs> Cocoa Board is projecting some 650,000 metric tons of cocoa beans in the 2024-2025 cocoa season. This is 160,000 metric tons short of the earlier target of 810,000 metric tons. This has been occasioned by a dry spell which has affected the Bono Ahafo and Western North regions, areas that account for more of Ghana's cocoa production. The minority has, however, served notice that it will drag the Cocoa Board CEO to Parliament to answer questions on the state of Cocoa Board. My colleague George Queenin uh, with that report. It will take us on to our very first break here on New Central. When we return, we're live in the regions for you. Please do stay. One bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint, superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint, superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. Mm. Colgate Herbal is formulated from unique natural herbs to strengthen teeth and keep gums healthy. Try Colgate Herbal, scientifically proven for strong teeth and healthy gums. This advert is FDA approved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, stop. Seven, one, two, eight. Good job, this. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah. Yeah. And now come you are back in Greece. She say why you fit down the lone. <laughs> yes, the luckiest at Aroma. She say about from Massa H M. Yeah. Now check this. Sister Abna aka Kobe Hima. <laughs> Ah, the luckiest at our room, Queen B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boss lady back up there. Let's go. Hold on to your seats, folks. Such anyway, it'll be you smooth. Where you end your friend who upgrade? Luckiest at our room. And the best part of that with the luckiest will be our shot to a good life and i'm talking to you me your girlfriend your ex your neighbors your landlords and even goro boys and no one is over dialing with lucky number star seven one now the Koswa Tour ticket to win in the community draw or the grand draw on the 30th of November 2024. The luckiest is regulated by the NLA on the Caritas platform, not for persons below 18 years. TNCs apply. Everybody knows Acrobato. And if you know Acrobato, it means you know M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. M Punch Homeopathy Clinic is my pillar. Let's hear what others are saying about M Punch. Problems <laughs> A free bra would the end point what does it? I'm a quiet no. Me just to say my name quite ye and pass one of my name in your hand and a magina sabema. Now maybe fear for the one in the jarrah. You heard everything. I have secret. M point is my secret. M point from your party clinic. I'm free. This is Key Point, the number one award-winning television news analysis program, providing an enlightened analysis of the key issues facing us as a country. The key points the stories that matter with the people who matter. This is Key Points, the number one award-winning television news analysis program. Every Saturday, 7 a.m. on TV3 and on Free FM 92.7. TV3, first in news. This afternoon on Regional Harbour's Touch Base at Sabronum in the Hafwano Southeast District of the Ashanti region, where the youth have vowed to put their lives on the line to protect their land against any form of illegal mining activity in the area. The illegal activity is, is being introduced in the area by the community. And the youth say they won't allow it to continue after realizing that their only water source is being polluted. The community has petitioned to the Asantehene to launch an investigation into the issue as they suspect some of the traditional leaders are behind it. Ibrahim Abubakar joins us with more explanation on this. Ibrahim, first talk to us about what we just saw and, you know, the entire situation in the area. Well, coming in so clearly, you could see that um, the residents are angry and disappointed with their leaders. 
In fact, some few months back, um, they realized that some miners have started bringing excavators um, in some of their reserves and on their land. And they resisted it. It even led to some clashes. But then the miners had to back off. But just some few weeks ago, they started seeing the miners coming back. This time around strongly and very armed. And also they had their way penetrating there and they, they started with their mining activities. Now they realize that the only water source um, is being polluted. And now when they even go to the farm, they have to carry along drinking water or even buy it on the way and just so they will be able to drink it. And it's also affecting them because they use the same water to um, irrigate their farms. They mobilized themselves and decided to come to Menchia to present a petition to the Asantini. Now, when they go to Menchia, their leaders were called to bring um, to tell Otun for what brought them there. And they decided to talk about chieftaincy issue because currently the community is without chief and there is a tech caretaker and some traditional authorities. So that is what angered the residents because they said that all along they mobilized themselves specifically to come there and talk about the Agalamse issue so that the Asantini could intervene and make sure they address it because they suspect some of their leadership to be behind this minutes only to come here and their leaders diverting whatever they brought. So some of the youth are angry and they vowed not to allow the activity to continue when they go back to their community. Let's take a listen to some of them who spoke to me. Galamsi is gradually failing us here at Sabronum. Our water bodies are being destroyed. Some of the community leaders are involved in the illegal activity. We now have to buy water to drink when we go to our farms. Yes, we are coffee and crack. It's a touch you near Nom. Nom Sagalamseno and Penyonfono Mufa. Now, Eddie Galamseno and him. Now, one more Jim Hosika at the internal. Because most of our leaders are behind the Galamse, they don't want us to wage war against the menace. But for the love we have for our community, we the youth have decided to use every means possible to protect our land. Beginning today, every mining equipment in Sabonu will be removed by force. Even if it has to cost us our lives, we will fight it. Whether the community leaders agree to our demands or not, we will bring an end to Galamse in our area. Ibrahim, let's talk about that water source, which is also a really important, uh, you know, source of concern for uh, the people of Sabrunum. Uh, you say it's the only source of uh, water for the people. Talk to us about it. Exactly. So um, currently it's been polluted to the extent that um, they are unable to drink it and they are even unable to use it to water their crops. So um, it's really, really a hectic time for farmers and those who want their crops to go to um, their expectation. They say they have to carry water from home just to come to their farms and water it. So it's something that they said, it just started some few weeks back. And now looking at the device uh, or the destruction is causing, uh, they don't want to allow it to continue in the uh, months to come, else mm. um, they may all be affected. So, I see. like they said, they will, go, they will go back and make sure that um, they move these miners there forcefully, whether they with the support of the leaders or not. Indeed, Ibrahim, thank you so much for the reporting. Ibrahim Abubakar joined us from Sabrunum, a community in the Ashanti region. We'll now take you to the Upper West region, where students of last year Tolu senior high school in the Wa West district are grappling with a trauma five months after the school multi-purpose hall was gutted by fire. The students say the situation is impacting academic work, including their health and social lives. Correspondent Ibrahim Wangara spent time with the students, he joins us with some updates from last year's senior high school. Ibrahim, talk to us. It's been five months since the incident. What is the environment like? 
Yes. Um, if you go to uh, Lasetiolu Senior High School at the moment, uh, you will think that everything uh, is okay with the students and the environment until they ring the bell for them to at least uh, come together to either take meal or to have uh, an assembly. That is where you notice that all is not well with the school. Since the banner of their multi-purpose hall, which is uh, commonly known or described as pink hall, uh, things are not going on well with these students as they begin to dine and wine under trees. And even socialization has also been an issue among these students. Let's take a listen to what some of the students have been telling us during our engagement. Of an eye, uh, having of nourishment and connection was reduced to ashes, leaving behind a trail of devastation and despair. The disaster left everyone in an excruciating pain, emotional distress, and inconvenient learning environment, which result in the loss of focus and ability to concentrate on academic work, morale, and motivation. The loss of furniture has demotivated we, the students, and our teachers. But when this hall went down, it was so disheartening. We didn't know what we were doing. And so it did affect not just our academics, but even our social lives. The trauma has come down. The encouragement from our teachers and our parents also prayed with us and they spoke with us. And we also had um, motivational speeches on things like this. I remember one particular statement by our teacher that this will be the beginning of our greatness and I took that to heart. Some students of last year at Senior High School there. Uh, you listen, Ibrahim, thank you so much for the reporting. Ibrahim Wangara joined us from the last year Senior High School where uh, students are in need of facilities after a fire gutted a really important uh, block there. But that'll be all for Regional Hub today. And we're continuing, returning, uh, interestingly, to one of our top stories this afternoon, which has to do with concerns over Ghana's cocoa sector and then the role of cocoa board in all of this. We know that the minority yesterday issued a press statement and spoke to the, the martyrs, raising quite a number of concerns, including what they say is a face-saving attempt by cocoa board not to go for a syndicated loan and the losses as well being recorded. Well, the chief executive of Cocoa Board has been responding to uh, these statements, and the emphasis is that they make the case that all of the argument as put forth by the minority is a lie. Starting from the paradigm shifts, they make the argument that uh, the assertion by the minority that international banks have rejected the Ghana Cocoa Board's request and that Cocoa Board was chased away from the market is false. they they argue that it is so because syndicated banks submitted term sheets in response to Cocoa Board's earlier request for proposals for consideration, but they chose not to go down that route because of a decision to change uh, the paradigm uh, dimensions of how things is done in the cocoa industry. On matters of source of funding for Cocoa Board, they make the argument that for the avoidance of doubt, the proposed decision to explore non-syndicated funding is a part of a broader strategy to diversify the source of funding. On profitability as well, they make the case that, amongst many other things, the claim that they've been making consistent losses uh, is not true. Now, they end by saying that Cocoa Board is urging the public to disregard the minority's press release, which seeks to politicize a strategic and forward-thinking policy decision. The board remains focused on its mandate to sustain and grow the cocoa industry, ensuring that it continues to contribute meaningfully to Ghana's economy and the livelihoods of cocoa farmers across the country. They are inviting all stakeholders, including members of the minority, to engage in a constructive dialogue and collaboration to continue the uh, growth of the cocoa sector. And so that's the latest in relation to this particular matter. And like I mentioned to you earlier, 
it is a subject matter that will continue to dominate the conversation because of the importance <coughs> of the cocoa industry. We can bring you election-related matters now because the 2024 manifesto promise of the NPP flag bearer, Dr. Baumia, to institute uh, electoral area share, amongst many other things, uh, for the Common Fund to facilitate development at the electoral area level, has received backing from the Greater Accra Association of Assembly Members. And Noble Crosby Annan is there for us. Let's get a bit more details. Crosby, what's informing their decision to back this uh, proposal by the NPP flag bearer? Well, essentially, Eric, what the group is saying is that the responsibilities or duties of these members who are facilitating development at a very uh, local level is very huge. Hence, they will need some forms of fund. They can stand that although uh, members of parliament have some funding, it does not get to their level, and even though it does not get to their level, they are the ones that community members charge to develop the yeah, various communities. If uh, a road network, a portion of the road is not as motorable as they expect it to be, they'll call on these assembly members. If the community needs some uh, water facilities or some uh, public facilities, they'll call on these assembly members to ensure that they get it done. But these assembly members do not have the monies that is needed or that is required for them to ensure that they are able to do it. Essentially, they're saying that what this fund will do for them, what their share will do for them, is to equip them with the needed uh, monies that will make them to be able to deliver to the expectations of uh, their community members. Crosby, many thanks. That's my colleague, Noble Crosby Annan. And we can move away from him and just touch on education briefly because the ranking member on the Education Committee of Parliament, Peter Nochukoto, is calling on uh, government to release monies owed suppliers of tablets distributed as part of government one student, one tablet initiative. Now, according to him, the supplier has fulfilled his obligation by a supplier by a total of 1,350,000 tablets. However, government has not followed through on its commitment to pay the supplier what is due them. They mentioned that they had distributed 900,000 tablets to senior high schools as part of the free SHS program. I listened to another speaker who said 90,000. So I don't know which is which. In our press release about uh, six or so weeks ago, we indicated that it's a program that uh, as a party, NDC, we support very much. But where you are not prepared for it, you don't have any budgetary allocation, and you go in, into it, you create problem for the suppliers. As we sit here, we know that 1,350,000 tablets were procured. That's the ranking on the Education Committee of Parliament, Peter Nochu Kuto. We can now do Ghana Remembers. Today, we put the focus on the NPP manifesto and aspects of it that appear to be either similar or the same as previous pledges in the 2020 elections. What am I talking about? Let's take a quick look at that. On the subject of governance, take a look at the 2024 promise. Reinitiate the process of getting MMDCEs elected through universal adult suffrage voting by that. Uh, but I want you to take note of the uh, word reinitiate. That's only because it appears also in the 2020 manifesto where we see working to build consensus towards amendment of articles 553 and 243 of the constitution and other consequential laws. Essentially, the election of MMDCEs on a partisan basis. On aviation, on aviation, we know that in 2020, the manifesto read that they will commence construction of a new airport in Cape Coast became a very thorny issue, a subject of debate for a very long time. It didn't happen in 2020, so what did the NPP do? Bring it back in 2024, where they say they will build, uh, construct this airport at Cape Coast 
under a $2 billion Korean facility. Sounds like a loan. Uh, in 2020 on housing, we know that the uh, NPP manifesto read that it will create land banks and provide infrastructure in partnership with landowners and district assemblies. We also see it uh, in 2024 when uh, this time not candidate uh, Ekufuado, not President Ekufuado, but we hear from vice president and candidates or as presidential aspirant, uh, Dr. Mohamed Dubaomia, repeats that promise and say provision of land banks to massa developers by reducing the bureaucracy around land acquisition uh, for housing. On petroleum, which is about the last one we're looking at today, uh, enforcing local content policies for the upstream and downstream subsectors in 2024. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Baumia and the NPP repeat that promise, and this is what they say. They will review and strengthen local content laws to close the gaps and deepen the role of Ghanaians and Ghanaian companies in our upstream activities. It's more worded, but eventually, essentially, is the same thing. Right? Sounds like a continuation or a continuum. When, you know, on a few subjects. Well, the government is, uh, like we've been told, yeah. if you took uh, an SHS government class, government is a continuum mm -hmm. and all of that. And so you can make that argument in one part as to why we're seeing this. But it brings about the, the extra question of how the government will mark itself by the promises it made in mm. 2020 vis-a-vis -vis what the level of work it's done. Because if you look at this... This is just a few sectors. If you go into the sports sector as well, there are quite a number of promises Absolutely. which are repeated as Absolutely. well. And so uh, it brings about the question of the many things you said you're going to do, of what percentage have you completed mm -hmm. that we can grade you and then we can look upon that work that you've done and begin to ask ourselves if we want to vote for you again. Mm -hmm. It's the critical question that a Absolutely. lot of people are asking. And, and perhaps the, the bit on the construction of the new airport... Uh -huh. It went through a certain level of criticism mm -hmm. when, when that announcement was it made did. in 22. The, the big question was, it's not important. There's an airport in, in Takradi. What's, what's the profit levels of that local or regional airport mm -hmm. such that you want to invest 2 billion US dollars in All a new that. facility? It didn't see the light of day, mm -hmm. obviously, because perhaps um, we didn't have enough in terms of revenue to deal with... with with our expenditure and Absolutely. other things. But what is informing the decision to bring it back and invest a whopping two billion? Uh, well, US money dollars? we're hoping to get from the Koreans. And, you know, perhaps these are questions that uh, Dr. Mohamedou Baumia will answer during his media engagement on Sunday, hopefully. Um, but listen, I'm going to get a little naughty here and say that you can't ask me, my Tiano, and then I don't see new things. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just me getting naughty. But that's it for Ghana Remembers. Right then, uh, let's just wrap up with, by way of info to you, the National Communications Authority has announced that officially internet service providers Starlink will officially begin operations in the country August ending. It comes in the wake of a continuous conversations about a reduction in data prices and whether or not government will see to it that its agenda of digitalization We'll also see a resultant effect of data prices reducing. Well, um, Starlink will soon, uh, August ending is what, some few days away, mm -hmm. and they should uh, as well officially receive all of the requisite licenses so that they can begin to operate. Are you going to get one for yourself? Uh, it's unlimited for a month, but I mean, yeah. the cost will be a bit intense. Yeah, the startup cost, uh, yeah. you know, here could be, you know. A bit intensive. In the regions of, uh, I don't want to. Yeah, we'll, wait, we'll wait for them to launch. Absolutely. <laughs> and then we can tell yeah. if 
those who've gone ahead and are using it are actually they got it at the right price yeah. or when they're officially in town the prices may and reduce. And please so don't inflate the prices you know please be, be gentle with us you know <laughs> vendors vendors out there are very excited yeah, anyway yeah, yeah. we've got to go let's take a look at that QR code absolutely kindly pick up your smartphone and do uh, one thing one last thing we're asking of you before we walk out of the studio scan that code for us quickly and join the three news whatsapp channel it's a big growing family like i say every afternoon it's where you'll find all things news related from our news cards to videos on uh explainers you name it and it has links that will take you as well to 3news.com do well to join it take part in the polls as and when we conduct them pick your thoughts on the relevant matters that's our bulletin for you i am maui naibeta and i am kemeni amano the afternoon show is next with anita and godwin bye bye from us